Hi folks, Kristen here. If you're in the Palm Springs area April 7th, be sure to stop by the historic Camelot Theater where I'll be introducing Preston Sturge's 1941 comedy Sullivan's Travel. You can buy tickets and learn more on Eventbrite now. And if you're in Los Angeles for the 2024 TCM Classic Film Festival, I'll be signing books on March 17th during the festival's pre-party at the Hollywood Heritage Museum. See you there! It won the Pulitzer Prize, the Critics' Award, the most revealing play ever written. New York, London, Paris, Brussels, Rome, all cheered it. It's an even greater motion picture. This is the story of a woman, Blanche Dubois, who wanted so much to stay a lady. A vivid, vibrant, exciting story, because every searching chapter was written by men. Men who taught her to trust and to hope, to love and to hate. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Lopez, and this is another episode of Ticklish Business. Always excited to be back. This week, we are celebrating both the centennial of one Marlon Brando, as well as Tennessee Williams by talking about that great time they teamed up for 1951's A Streetcar Named Desire. And we are joined by a fount of information, an author, a legend, in my opinion. You are indelible to me, sir. Author of Hollywood and the movies of the 50s, The Collapse of the Studio System, The Thrill of Cinerama, and The Invasion of the Ultimate Body Snatcher, Foster Hirsch. Foster, how are you? Hi, Kristen. Thanks for having me on. Oh my gosh. Thank you for wanting to sit and spend some time and talk about Marlon Brando, Tennessee Williams, the 50s, this movie. I'm excited to get into all of it. But before we get into that, we like to make our regular case. If you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, and then you should. We do all sorts of additional bonus content, including our show Doubled Features, looking at remakes. We are in the process of recording an episode on a movie I'm very eager to talk about because the remake is supposedly absolutely horrible. We also have, based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. I also have my interview coming up with Dave Carter that has been recorded, and I can't wait for everybody to see it. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. We are also inching closer to 50 patrons, and for our 50th patron, we have a nice little prize package that I've put together with some stuff. I'm going to put a picture of that up on social media soon. So check out patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And don't forget that me and Emily are both authors as well. We have our books out. You can order them wherever you get books. And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by Samantha Richardson, as well as Terrence Hilt, featuring your favorite stars, including our always popular Jean Kelly, Judy Garland, Makoko mugs. You can find those at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. Foster, you've written several books, all of them fantastic. But this one looks specifically at the 1950s. And the movie we're talking about today is, takes place in 1951. What is it about the 50s that makes it both such a legendary decade and a decade you wanted to write a book about? The second part of that is the one I can answer very readily. I wanted to write a book about the 50s because, Christian, that was my decade. I have to admit my age. I'm old enough to say <laughs> I grew up going to movies in the 1950s. And as I was going from a kid to a teenager, I was already a crazy moviegoer. So I saw almost all the movies that I write about in this book when they first came out. I felt very protective of the 50s. I said, that's my decade. And I may be the last writer from that period who will write about the period. I hope many more books will be written about the 50s, but they won't be written by somebody who was there. They'll be written by younger people like you who will have a different perspective. I was there. So I know things that you can know only from being a participant in history as it was happening. The related reason is so many people have a very stereotyped view of the 50s as a silly, superficial, conformist, consumer-ridden decade, flush with money, post-war power, uninteresting decade. We can't wait to get to the 60s because that's when really interesting things start to happen. Well, of course, the 60s were fabulous and an extraordinary revolutionary decade, but the 60s wouldn't have happened without the 50s. 
the 50s led to the 60s. The 50s were a time of great discord and discontent and revolution and the rise of young people and the teenagers. So I wanted to trace that before defending the 50s from its very low reputation. And then connected to that is, it's my belief, and I hope I demonstrated in the book, that there are more great movies that were made in the 50s than in any other 10-year period in American filmmaking, in my opinion. More classics in every genre, musicals, westerns, epics, film war, science fiction, war film, but terrific. The only decade that didn't really shine in the 50s was comedy, because the decade was not a comic decade. It was <laughs> lined with darkness and anxiety. Comedy didn't thrive in the 50s. There were some good ones, but they're rare. There are a lot of bad ones. I'm defending. <laughs> Does that mean then that the 1950s, in your opinion, is better than 1939, which is often considered the single greatest year in cinema? That was an extraordinary year and a kind of climactic point of the early triumph of the studio system. The 50s represent the beginning of the end of the studio system. The studio system was triumphant in 1939. The studio system was still functioning in the 50s, but it was on its way out. It didn't really die off completely until the 60s. And if I could plug, that's my next book, because Hollywood in the 60s is really part two of Hollywood in the 50s. They're a continuing historical tapestry. I'm not done. 50s take us up to a certain point. The 60s, in a sense, completes the period. To answer your question directly, 1939, extraordinary films. I would have to give the nod to the 50s. There were more great films in the 50s than any other period in American film history. The bold, bold claim. If bold I, claim. Please do not send me your emails that 1939 is better. 1939 was an extraordinary year. The 1950s were an extraordinary day because it was a True. longer period of time. There an opportunity for more great film. Do you remember seeing Streetcar Named Desire when it came out? Now, that's a good question. I saw Place in the Sun in 1951. Streetcar Named Desire was considered too racy for a kid. I could get in with my parents to see Place in the Sun. I don't think they wanted to take me to a streetcar. I saw that only later. I'd have to disagree with your parents. Place in the Sun's pretty sexy. Monty Clift in Shelley Winters, that scene in the house where it's just the whispering, that gets your heart pump in there. Streetcar Named Desire was an important film that changed the beginning of the change of the production code because Jack Warner had to go to bat to defend this film and Ilya Kazan, the director, because there were implications of homosexuality and implications of rape. Both those subjects were off the table in early 1950s filmmaking. So they had to challenge the censorship boards and the production code to get the film released. They made some cuts. They had to. But the implication of rape is very strong. And the implication of homosexuality is there if you know what to look for and listen to. But it certainly diminished from what it was in the play. Those were two verboten subjects. When it was released, Kristen, I remember that. This was considered really adult filmmaking. This began to write a new chapter in mature content for American movies. So it's very important in terms of the moral code and the production code and censorship battles and freeing the cinema for a wider range of subjects. And Jack Warner went to bat for this. Kazan wanted to protect the play. He had directed the original production on Broadway. And then he wanted to protect Tennessee Williams and his material. But Jack Warner could have copped out, but said, no, this film has to be released according to what my director says. People say bad things about Jack Warner. But he stepped up to the plate on this one. You bring up A Place in the Sun and this also are examples of the change in acting style, too. Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando, both big proponents of the method. I know that when I watched the trailer for this, the original preview, they emphasize Marlon Brando, this bright new shining star, this 
new actor with a capital A. This was really his debut film that showcased what the method really was about. We just talked about the heiress on the last episode and the struggles that other people had working with Montgomery Clift, but watching Montgomery Clift evoke the method, I see the method more in Brando here than I tend to do in Montgomery Clift in Place in the Sun or The Heiress. Maybe I'm just seeing something that's not there. They both evoke the method. The Actors Studio, which is the birthplace of the method, was founded in 97. And the first full public demonstration of the method was the original Broadway production of A Streetcar Named Desire, which opened on December 4th, 1947, at the Barrymore Theater, and it was a strike of lightning. Maybe Broadway's had one opening night of comparable power since then, and that would be the opening Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which was a thunderbolt, but there's been nothing since. That was taken at the time. It wasn't that history looked back and said, wow, this is historically important at the time. Kazan's production of Streetcar Named Desire was heralded as something radically new in the history of American acting. And it was a display of the method. Kazan was one of the co-founders of the studio. He'd been a member of the group theater where the method really was born, influenced by Stanislavski. The production of Streetcar was a showcase for method-trained actors. What's interesting is that when they came to make the movie, only three of the actors were method-trained, Marlon Brando, Tim Hunter, and Carl Malden, recreating their original Broadway roles. Jessica Tandy, the original Blanche, was not signed for the movie because Jack Warner said, we need a movie star. And they found Vivian Lee, Scarlett O'Hara, certainly a movie star. But Vivian Lee was trained in the British system, not in the method. I did get to know Kim Hunter near the end of her life. She was a wonderful woman and very confessional and frank. And she said, when we first started making the film, to be honest, none of us liked Vivian Lee. She was working in a different style than the one that we had all been trained in at the studio. And she kept saying, well, when Larry and I did this in London, her husband, then husband, Lawrence Olivia, directed her in a West End production of Streetcar. Kazan finally said to her, Vivian, you are not in London with Larry. You are in Burbank at Warner Brothers with us. From that point, she stopped talking about the British production and she became more a part of the company. But isn't it interesting that the character of Blanche, who after all is an outsider in the play, was an outsider during the production. The three American actors and the American director initially looked at her askance. They were suspicious of her. And she's an outsider. Blanche, she's a visitor. It was perfect casting. When they saw how hard she was working and to what extent her commitment was and how much she wanted to realize all the depth of this great character, they really began to respect her and even to like her. But her approach to acting is fundamentally different from theirs. The method actor starts inside. The British technique, you begin with externals. It's from the outside in. The method is inside to projection. Different approach. Before we get into the weeds, I'll throw out the plot for people that didn't read this in high school or college. It's set in New Orleans. You have the story of Blanche Dubois, played by, as you mentioned, Vivian Lee, who comes to visit her sister Stella, played by Kim Hunter, and Stella's husband, Stanley, played by Marlon Brando. And of course, things go very wrong very quickly. It deals with, as we mentioned, allusions to homosexuality, sexual assault. I want to go back to what you said about Vivian Lee, because I was doing some research and Kazan made no bones about the fact that he didn't really want her. He wanted Jessica Tandy. Supposedly, it took Kazan a while to really appreciate her. But even then, he said that she wasn't a great actor. He felt she was a light performer. 
I know Vivian Lee herself was very conflicted about playing this character that I see Vivian Lee's career in two periods, which is Scarlett O'Hara playing a lot of Scarlett O'Hara types and then playing Blanche Dubois, playing a lot of Blanche Dubois types. But yet she works so well here because you need that etherealness to her, that woman out of time, out of place, who is constantly trying to please. Just the story itself was mirrored by the production circumstances. You had a visiting star from England, trained in a different tradition, married to a man who had directed her in London in a different style, thrown in with a group of American method actors and the leading method director. Their approach was different. They resented her at first, but Kazan ultimately saw how right she was for the part, and he ended up feeling she was better than Jessica Tandy. But it was his feeling that neither of them plumbed all the depths that there were in this great part. It's the kind of part where you could dig for years and not get to the bottom of it. It's unfinishable in a sense. That's part of its richness and its greatness. But Kazan really ended up respecting her a lot. He said she gave everything to that performance. And it ultimately was a very persuasive performance. Kim Hunter said the same thing. We saw how hard she was working. We really began to respect her. But she was still an outsider. I read that she had a very body sense of humor, which allowed her to take on Brando, who famously often was not very nice or appropriate to a lot of his leading ladies. And yet Vivian was able to work with that and got her a second Oscar. So clearly it benefited her. The thing that's hard for me to parse, and, you know, I don't know, Foster, if you would have a different viewpoint coming at it from living during that time period. But for me, it's always hard to separate the knowledge that she was in the early midst of suffering from manic depression and the mental illness that would eventually plague her for the rest of her life, effectively end her marriage to Laurence Olivier. It's hard not to see life imitating art, imitating life, especially as the movie enters its third act. You being closer to that time period, if that's necessarily what audiences would have seen at all. I don't know that she was diagnosed as manic depressive in 1950, 1951. She certainly had a history of very serious mental illness throughout her life. Part of the terror of playing Blanche for Vivian Lee herself was that the character on the edge of collapse cut close to the bone. It was very close to who she was. And the manic episodes that Vivian Lee would have, wild sexual abandon, echo some of Blanche's sexual extremism. Blanche and Vivian Lee were very closely connected to each other, probably to a degree that terrified the actress. The other characters were playing roles. She was playing something that might well have, to her, resembled her own life. It's such a trap because Blanche Dubois is one of those great American characters up there with Amanda from The Glass Menagerie. I mean, everybody wants to play Blanche Dubois, but so many fall into the trap of playing Vivian Lee. I know that they've remade this a a bunch of times, as well as done numerous stage productions. The version that I remember hearing about in the 90s was Jessica Lange, Watching that version, I'm just like, oh, Jessica Lange's just playing Vivian Lee, playing Blanche Dubois. That's got to be great for a performer to be so indelible with a role. But it's also got to be really terrible for an actor to be so indelible with a role. But in fact, all four of the actors from the film, three of whom won Oscars, and unaccountably, the only one who didn't was Marlon Brando, and it went to (laughs) Humphrey Bogart, an African queen. I'm sorry he didn't deserve it. That's probably the male version of the Grace Kelly, Judy Garland debate right there. It is indeed right there. Brando gives a riveting and revolutionary performance. It changed the face of American film acting, and he doesn't win. I can tell you why. Kim Hunter told me this. In the play, Brando on stage was so commanding that audiences loved him. And they started being amused by him and their sympathy went to him and they started laughing 
cut Tandy as Blanche. That was not William's intention. William's intention was to create a contest between two characters who were equally matched. So you had mixed feelings about each of them. Brando was so compelling that you liked him and rooted for him and you were against Blanche. Not the case. That's not what Kazan wanted. It's not what Tennessee Williams wanted. So when he made the film, Kazan wanted to be sure that Brando doesn't dominate. In fact, it's not his film. It's Vivian Lee's. It's a great performance, but Vivian Lee is the centerpiece. And you never lose sympathy with her. She really is. It's back and forth. It's like watching a great tennis match between the two of them. I remember seeing this in college. And the first time we talk about star making first scenes, that infamous smash cut to John Wayne's face and stagecoach is like, this is your star moment. Rando gets the star moment that defines all star moments the minute he comes in. And he meets Blanche and decides to take his T-shirt off, which supposedly brought back T-shirts into the popular culture after Clark Gable got rid of them in It Happened One Night. What I appreciate about Brando, with the caveat that now knowing what we know about Brando and that he's a very problematic figure in classic film, every time I see that introduction to him, he's gorgeous, he's intimidating, You can understand why Stella puts up with so much. I mean, the play, Tennessee Williams' original play, people forget, it's very much subverting the sexual politics that maybe people now associate, you can say rightly or wrongly, Foster, you're the expert on the decade, but people tend to assume the 50s is this very chaste, asexual decade. This film and the success of this film, and you cited Place in the Sun, the success of these two films proves up yeah. alone, proves no, otherwise. It was a very, very smutty decade. I love that. The more repressed an era is, probably the more subversive sexually it is. And this very much is about the sexual politics of the time period. Stanley is gorgeous. The fact that he's emphasized as a sexually virile character, you understand why Stella puts up with what is abuse. The yelling and the throwing stuff around, there's that scene, I referenced it when I talked about the heiress, where he comes in dirty with the grease from the car. Stella and Blanche have just had this conversation where Blanche is trying to convince Stella to leave. Brando comes in and he just smiles at her and she runs to his arms. You understand why she does that, that there's something charming. There's something potent about him. When I interviewed Kim Hunter, I interviewed her several times. I don't know where... I got the courage or the foolhardiness to ask her. I said, were you attracted? Were you yourself attracted to Marlon Brando? It's a valid question. And she paused for a minute, probably thinking, this is an impertinent question. She paused and then she said, God, yes. That's the right answer. I don't know anybody that watches that movie, male or female. Not Stella. Kim Hunter was attracted to not Stanley, but to Marlon Brando, the actor himself. And she liked him a lot. She said some of the publicity that he got over the years was not accurate, that he could be very caring and a very considerate co-player. She thought he was a very decent person. You know that Brando really fought against this role. He didn't want to be Stanley Kowalski for a long time. He didn't want to be known as a good-looking actor either. I know a lot of people that have theorized that his changing physique over the last several decades of his life was a response to wanting to be taken seriously as a performer. And also a rejection of the beautiful male image that he was uncomfortable with. It was a burden to him. He shed it. He put on more and more weight over the years. He would, at night, just eat buckets of Haagen-Dazs. He didn't drink at all, but it was Hagen Das, Hagen Das, Hagen Das. He had to have the doors in his Holland house widened so he could get through them. He almost luxuriated in becoming neurotically overweight. He was almost making a statement. He certainly didn't want to play Stanley Kowalski, and he didn't. Within the next few years, he plays Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. And what people don't remember, he was a very good Napoleon in Desiree. And he chose to play Napoleon with a clipped British accent. Not American. He sounded nothing 
like Stanley Kowalski. And in fact, people said Brando mumbled. Brando didn't mumble at all. He had perfect, clear diction. Stanley Kowalski mumbled. That was a character choice, an important difference. Just the fact that in the 50s, later in the 50s, he would do Guys and Dolls. Rightly or wrongly, whether Brando should have sang and danced is neither here nor there, but he attempted to make a musical, which that's something. I saw Reflections in a Golden Eye for the first time this year. That's a, that's a great film. It's a really interesting film. And if we're talking about coded sexuality and queer readings of films, that character that he plays is very much coded. Remember, that's 1967. He was, that is overtly homosexual. He was definitely know. open to subverting everybody's expectations. You can't say that Brando was one specific genre of performer. He quite I literally know. tried it all. He did everything. I do say in the book, Kristen, because my book is tough and talking to me. I'm a person with very definite opinions. But in the book, I make this claim. So far, I haven't gotten anybody who's written a nasty or complaining letter. I say Marlon Brando is the greatest actor in the history of movies. I don't think anybody don't, disagree with you there. I don't think there's a greater. I really don't. I've seen every performance he ever gave, every single one. He doesn't throw away a single performance, even... When the films aren't great, he's always doing something powerful, compelling, and interesting. Always. He was a genius. It's so fascinating to talk about Brando subverting expectations of what he could do as an actor and as a man. And yet, Vivian Lee in this movie is Blanche. Her character is also attacking the sexual hypocrisy of women at this time. Blanche is a woman that has a very promiscuous past and is persecuted for it by Stanley. Her relationship with Carl Malden's character, Mitch, is so sweet. This is one of those movies where I know the ending. I know the ending, and yet I always wish, just for a second, that Carl Malden's character is going to come in, say he wants to marry her, and that it doesn't matter about her past, and it always matters. It always matters, because that is being a woman, just in general, especially in the 1950s. But remember, the material was written in the 40s, so it's even True. older than the film. The sensibility emerges out of the 40s when the double standard was rampant, as it still was in the 50s. Is it still with us in some ways even now? I'd say yes. In some ways, Blanche having a wayward past as, as a teen. If anything, the biggest change is Vivian Lee was 38 when this came out, so she's pushing 40. The biggest thing that I always notice is evocative of the time period is she's very much considered an old maid. She's hiding in, in dark corners. She doesn't like bare bulbs. Blanche you brought, she would love plastic surgery. I think she would love Botox if she was born in the modern era. But her oversensitivity about her age yeah. reflects the double standard we're talking about. Stanley's not going to be worried about growing older. It's not going to matter to him. And he'll still have the same sexual opportunities as he had as a younger man. But for the woman, a woman is charting a different terrain, different territory. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon yet? You should, just like Ali Moore, Amy Hart, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Krista Painter, McGeff, and Rachel Clark. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, watch exclusive video interviews, receive merch, and even guests on an episode. You also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Double Features, and our latest series, But Have You Read The Series? It all starts at just $1 at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. That ageism is probably the thing that is unfortunately still prevalent today as it was in 1951, especially with actresses. We talked about Vivian Lee having this post-Blanche Dubois era, and she played this character before she did it in The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone in, in 61 which is also about an older woman of a certain age meeting a young guy played by Warren Beatty with a hilariously bad Italian accent. We also are still joking now about Melissa Joan Hart as an actress in her 40s playing a grandmother for a Lifetime movie or something. So it's still something very much that happens. It's not gone. It hasn't disappeared. It's still part of the culture, but it's very much reflected in this material. The brand of Stanley is going to be indifferent to aging. His sexual prowess will not be affected. His sexual opportunities will not be affected by growing older. But for Blanche, they are. 
and she feels it. She's deeply yeah. self-conscious. It's a really great parallel to her playing Scarlett O'Hara. Both of those characters are Southern Bells. And yet I think Blanche is far more representative too of the kind of changing mores of the time period. She's Southern. There's the sense of gentility. Men are gentlemen and women are ladies. I always notice how Vivian Lee's character just, she has no guile. She has no tact. And when she sees the house where Stella is living, she says, this is where they live. They can't live here. She tells Stella to her face. I didn't think you'd be living in a place like this. This is so horrible. And yet, to most viewers watching it, their apartment's pretty dang big for living in New Orleans in 1951. There is this sense of if you live in a big city at all, it's this weird representation of both a fairy tale city and a real city. Yet for Blanche, she really misses that Southern quality of respectability and opulence and wealth and manners. Which the family did have when they had Belle Reeve and they lost it. So she is faded aristocracy. She and Stella had an aristocratic background. And so yep. living in the French Quarter in New Orleans in a apartment where the walls seem to perspire. And by the way, Kazan wanted movable walls so that in heightened moments of the drama, the walls actually close in and the apartment grows smaller to emphasize Blanche's sense of growing entrapment. Next time you look at the film, notice that there are subtle shifts in the space of that apartment. It gets smaller. Part of that sense of aristocracy is what Stanley is attracted to. He tells Stella towards the end of the movie that when she met him, she thought he was common and he took her down from that pedestal and she was really into it. And now somebody's telling her that she should expect more, rightly or wrongly. I don't think Streetcar gets enough discussion about how it looks at commerce and wealth. This changing concept of the American dream that told everybody, everybody deserved chicken in every pot and a house. And yet Stanley is very much like, if I have this woman on my level who is financially and is superior to me, then I can have a little bit of that shine pass on me. He talks about the Napoleonic code is this way that everything that belongs to the woman belongs to the man. And yet he's really hoping for a little bit of that luster to rub off on him. You say correctly, streetcar is very much about class issues and about the changing South, the changing manners of the South from the aristocratic antebellum society to the postbellum society that Williams writes about in other plays, including Glass Menagerie. So in many ways, Amanda and Glass Menagerie is similar to Blanche in evoking the elegant past that they no longer have, but they idealize in memory. I want to talk about Kim Hunter because I don't think she gets talked about nearly enough. I've seen her in this. I've seen her in The Seventh Victim which is a very different role from Stella. And it's worth a view if you are a horror fan. I know it's a Val Luton movie. I don't consider it a horror movie, but it's worth it if you want to see her in a very different role. She's also so good in this. She has this naturalness to her, which I'm sure is the method, that you need that grounding influence. You need somebody who is trying very hard to be kind of a voice of reason and failing because of their own faults and their own flaws as a person. It's one of those moments where every time I watch her performance, she's the one I get the most worked up over watching because I'm just like, I want her to do something different. Stand up. She's one of those characters that I love how you can just see her plot out a scene as if it has a deep history to it. It's not something that just begins and ends with the camera. You can see her processing things as if this is really her life. You can. There is a moment in her first scene at the bowling alley, her union with her sister, and they're sitting at a table at that bowling alley, and Blanche is talking, and she's talking too much, and she's a little overexcited. Stella doesn't say anything, but you can see in Stella's eyes her awareness that there's something wrong with her sister. It's not said in words. There's a look of disappointment, of sorrow, of shock. All of this 
passing through Stella's eyes, and of course, placed there by Kim Hunter, who is working on what the method calls prior circumstances. She's supplying the history of their relationship as sisters. I said to Kim Hunter, when I saw that look you give Blanche in the bowling alley scene, when you realize she's hyper and manic and there's something wrong with her, the look that crosses your eyes, I was ready to give you the Oscar right then and there. It's terrific. (laughs) And she does that throughout. She's working in the method. She's internalizing. She's finding sense memories. She's creating prior circumstances. If you know technique of the method, you see it at work in this film, in what she and Carl Malden and Marlon Brando are doing. It is an extraordinary demonstration of a new and revolutionary acting style. One could say about Brando's Kowalski, it was the most electric debut. No, it wasn't his debut. He'd been in other plays before this. It was the most electric opening night performance ever. I've talked to people who were there on the opening night of A Streetcar and said it was just in orbit. Anything you see by comparison almost pales. That excitement about great acting is there on screen for everyone to see. It's there. And it changed the face of American acting. I would say this. Every actor, Jack Nicholson's, the Matt Damon's, all the actors we prize because they seem real and comfortable and natural on screen. Every one of them owes a debt to Brando, especially as Stanley in Streetcar and Terry Malloy in On the Wall. Yeah. That's Brando's greatest performance. Going back to my book, people have asked me, talk so much about the 50s. What's the greatest film of the 50s? On the Waterfront. What's the greatest performance of the 50s? Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront. Aaliyah Kazan said, Kazan, who directed Brando in both films, said, if there's a greater performance in all of American films than Marlon Brando in uh, On the Waterfront, I don't know of it. Kazan, the preeminent actor's director, said that about his star. And he said, people like to attribute to Brando the beginnings of the method, but he said, I'm not sure how much anybody taught Brando. He was a genius. You just told him a little bit, and he went from there, embroidering and deepening. What he knew couldn't really be taught. To go back to Kim Hunter really briefly, this role is so indelible with her career, and yet when I was looking at her credits after this, she really became a fixture on television. I mean, she had a career that lasted till 2001, but I'm curious why... Hollywood didn't utilize her in more films? That's a good question. She was, at the time, right after Streetcar, blacklisted. She was not a communist. She was liberal. She had signed some papers or documents. She was under some kind of political cloud. And she was virtually unemployable for a number of years after Streetcar, crucial years after winning the Oscar. Once she then got reinstated, her career never fully took off from the success of Streetcar, this indelible performance. She was a victim of the blacklist. She was what they call gray-listed, that had had an inhibiting effect at the time. Exactly. Sometimes to be gray-listed was actually just as bad as being actually blacklisted. Right, just as bad. Yeah. You were were really looked at with great suspicion, called guilt by association. Not fair. Not fair at all. As somebody who is a diehard ride-or-die John Garfield stan, and at the time of recording, it is actually John Garfield's birthday. It always comes back to the blacklist at some point. And that's unfortunate, because... Kim Hunter was beautiful, but she was not a glamazon. She was not otherworldly gorgeous compared to... Her beauty was very real and grounded. Right. Like a real person. I would have loved to have seen that more just because the 50s is often this decade of aesthetics when Donna Reed and Pearls and Grace Kelly. I would have loved to have seen someone like Kim Hunter just eating up the screen. Kim Hunter never had a really great role after Stella, but she had this one great role, unforgettable. I live near where she lived in Greenwich Village, 
for years, and outside her building, there's a plaque on the wall marking Kim Hunter, the creator of Stella and Streetcar Named Desire, lived here for many decades above the Cherry Lane Theater on Commerce Street. But it cites her contribution to American theater in the creation of this great role. So it's That's just a so amazing. Plaque, oh, my gosh. Plaque in tribute to her. She was a wonderful neighbor and a wonderful citizen of Greenwich Village. She was very active in the culture of the village and in her block, a beloved, a beloved neighbor. I want to talk about some of the changes that got made between the play and the film, because, of course, they couldn't talk about everything. And one of the big changes that they changed from the original Tennessee Williams is that Blanche's marriage to the boy, as she says throughout the film, a lot of his suicide is implied very heavily in the play as the result of him being gay. It's more than implied in the play. It's been a minute but, since I've read the play, so yeah, I could be, yeah. yeah. I think it's stated, but in the film, and this is something that Kazan and Jack Warner couldn't change if they wanted the film to be released. Blanche, in that big speech, couldn't say that her husband, her ex-husband, committed suicide, was gay. She talks about him as being weak, which, okay, you can read it as a code if you want, but it's a pretty poor substitute, and it's sort of cowardly. But this is 1951. They couldn't say yeah. it. So he's weak. And the end of the film also was mandated by the production yeah. code because Stella is heartbroken about her sister's downfall. And she blames Stanley. And she leaves and goes upstairs with the baby to her neighbors saying she's never going to return. But we know she is going to return. But they can't show it. So at the end of the film, at least on the surface, she leaves her husband getting those colored lights going. She leaves her husband because of what he did to her sister. But that's just a cover. I don't think anybody believes that. She's going to be downstairs yeah. for 24 hours. Know that the code said that the bad had to be punished and yeah. good has to prevail. That's a little harder to do when you're talking about sexual assault. The movie, I think, does a tasteful job you can use that term when describing the subject matter in terms of presenting that it is an assault there's that mirror shot that mirror that happens breaks, and do you remember the shot that follows right after the cracking mirror a fire hydrant a water gushing out of a fire hydrant which audiences at the time not being stupid would have recognized as a code for sexual orgasm couldn't show anything, but you could imply it. Once that happens, you get the, the kindness of strangers line. Poor Blanche goes to a sanitarium, the Elysian Fields. I do love that the play sets up the trajectory of where Blanche is going. She gets off at a streetcar named Desire, then goes to cemeteries, then yeah. to Elysian Fields. The play, it's pretty much implied that Stella's going to stay, that this is her life and this is her bed, so to speak, and she's made it. I always get a little irked when the worst thing that can happen to Stanley Kowalski at the end of the movie is that his wife leaves him. If good is supposed to triumph and the villain gets its comeuppance, maybe going to jail or dying might be a comeuppance. You know, I know why the ending is picked. It would not have been done otherwise. It wouldn't have been released without it. I always have to chuckle kind of derisively that his punishment is that his wife is gone. Probably for 24 hours. if Right, not. exactly. And also, he looks like Marlon Brando. He can find a new wife. He'll be fine at the end of the day. But he's not a bad character. He's cruel to Blanche, but he feels threatened by Blanche. She's the invader in his house. She's insulted him in his house. There's a class issue we've talked about. He also recognizes that she's attracted to him. There's also a real immaturity to his character, too. He's that guy that wants to be babied, and Stella is very much a mother to him in terms of taking care of the house. The way he eats dinner, where he's just eating the chicken with his hands, he acts very much like a child. There are moments where I don't like to laugh, but some of the line readings that Brando gives when he throws the plate, and he says, I've cleaned up my place, do you want me to take yours? And she goes to hunch over no, the plate. No, you're absolutely encouraged to laugh. He's funny. One of yeah. the things 
that's so attractive about that character is he's a wit. We're supposed to laugh at him. And that's the complication of William's a character. He creates a character about whom we have divided feelings, as we do about Blanche. And what Kazam was working for is a balance between them. They're both very strong characters. Stanley is challenged by Blanche because he recognizes her strength. Not is it that she's attracted to him? Probably at some level, he's also attracted to her, although he's certainly attracted to the idea of conquering her and asserting his male supremacy. And remember, Stanley was written by a gay playwright who was, in the writing, attracted to Stanley. And in the real world, Tennessee Williams himself was attracted to characters like Stanley. So you've got the playwright's own attraction to his character filtering in to and, in a sense, influencing the way we react to the character. We talked about how dangerous it is for anybody to play Blanche after Vivian Lee. Who would want to touch Stanley after Prando? Who could? So many actors have tried. Always in the shade of Brando. The most recent version that I saw was Ben Foster did it with Gillian Anderson. Paul Mescal most recently did it as well on stage. In London? It's impossible to top Brando at all. I wouldn't even try. The film really is successful as a film. Kazan thought he was transcribing a play. It's not that. It's a powerful work of film art. Beautifully photographed, designed, edited. It's not at all the transcription of a theater piece. It's a movie. And it's definitive. I'm glad there has not been, unless I missed it, a feature film of Streetcar Since. The only one I know of is from 95, and I think that's a TV movie. Yes, that's so, different. Yeah. That's different. A major feature film of Streetcar would be yeah, foolhardy. Do you make a film of On the Waterfront? Leave it alone. Give Warner Brothers or somebody time. They'll try to mine it for IP. I'm not (laughs) sure. I think people are afraid of it. They've never gone back to the well on Waterfront. I want to close out and talk about Elia Kazan for a minute. Also a very controversial figure. There are still many people today that do not like Elia Kazan because of how he responded to HUAC. Really, the 1950s, he had some of his most iconic films. After Streetcar Alone, he reteamed with Brando for Viva Zapata and On the Waterfront, James Dean for East of Eden, Carl Malden in one of my favorite movies, which is Baby Doll. Very underrated. Isn't that a great film? Talk about great method acting. Carl Malden, Eli Wallach, Carol Baker, Mildred Dunnick. That's a fabulous quartet of method trained actors. Fun fact, you connected me with Carol Baker. It's how I was able to interview her and talk to her about making that movie did get to speak with her. Oh, yeah. It was fantastic. Kazan had just hit after hit after hit through the entirety of the decade. He made his testimony. It was hard for him to do it. It's silly to say he did it as if it was a breeze. It was extraordinarily difficult. He did not mind talking about his own communist past because he rejected communism. He thought it was a danger. He thought it was a totalitarian system mind control. He rejected it. It was a youthful folly, he said. But they asked him to name names. That he did not want to do. But he did do it. And to this day, there are those who hold that against him. Somebody posted a video of the Oscars where he got, it was his Life Achievement Award. Ed Harris very famously did not stand for him. It's fascinating to me Especially now, when we talk so much about canceling people and all of those things, when that took place, most people, I know that I didn't know about Kazan and HUAC until well after the 2000s, when the internet becomes prevalent. People find out about these things later, and they're like, oh, okay. It's interesting how long people have held on to that. Held on to that, and they have branded him as the ultimate traitor. Irony is, because I did a lot of research for my book in Blacklist Period, the committee knew all the names already. To ask people like Kazan to name names was simply a way for humiliating. It's a flex. It's a power move, essentially. It was a power move. It was the height of cruelty. 
they knew the names because Anne did not give them a name they didn't already have. It was just a way of humiliating him. It worked. He's branded to this day, but it was an act of great cruelty. It was a terrible time, the blacklist period. But the villain is not Kazan. It's the committee itself asking those questions. We are a podcast where we talk often about how do we separate art and the artist. I know with me and Kazan, I'm aware, I have my opinions, but the movies are still fantastic. I don't think that can be discounted regardless. No. The movies are just so fantastic. If we talk and, about and Baby Doll period, at any point, ugh. You know, but his greatest period was after his testimony. Because he testified cooperatively, he got the chance to make his greatest films, one right after the other. A fabulous streak of creativity. That's a run. I don't know any director that has a run of that many films concurrently. So many great films, one yeah. right after the other. And great acting. Yeah. Displays of method virtuosity at its height. Doing so much research for The Blacklist, I asked myself as I was doing the research, if you were there, how would you have behaved under the exact circumstances? Very easy for us to say, of course, I would have done the right thing. But if we were faced with the choices that people like Kazan and Bud Schulberg and the other witnesses had, would we have held on to what we considered our un inviolate principles or would we have compromised? It's so easy yeah. to say how we would have behaved, but we weren't placed in that position. We weren't there. And I had to say to myself, I don't know how I would have behaved. John Garfield, many people say the stress of having his career ruined is what ultimately killed him. That's the thing I think is so frustrating and upsetting about the time period is that there were people that genuinely grappled with that decision. They were damned if they did. They were damned if they didn't. Many people died just from the sheer stress of being involved. It was a horrible period in which you were punished for your political beliefs. Aren't we in a period like that now, in a way? Cancel culture, if you don't have the right correct the orthodox beliefs, you could be canceled. The political designations right and left may have changed or reversed, but we're still in that position of intolerance for the political those we disagree with politically. To bring it all back to streetcar to close us out, regardless of all of the production issues, whether you talk about Kazan making this and Brando being problematic, the film is a masterpiece, in my opinion. It's fantastic. Everything about it just hits. I will rewatch this movie and just be awed that they got so many people in the right place at the right time. And it's a film they've been talking for an hour about deep, complex topics about one movie that really is a film that you can really sink your teeth into and still be entertained by. That's an important thing to bring up. It's not a film that's taking your medicine. It's not Judgment at Nuremberg. I know this is the fifth time I brought up Judgment at Nuremberg <laughs> on the last three episodes. One day we will just do Judgment at Nuremberg so that I can stop talking about it. This is a movie that you can really be entertained and watch it as a film. You can also study it as an academic, as a writer, or playwright, any of that. It is one of the greats. Foster, final thoughts on Streetcar? I couldn't agree with you more. What we want to absolutely say is the film is incredibly moving. Of course, we've seen it so many times, we know how it turns out. But don't you get a tightening in your throat by the end of the film, even though you know what's coming? You're moved, deeply moved, as if for the first time. It has yeah. that visceral power to grab you and doesn't let you go. Time after time after time, it never fails. It's worth repeated viewing. Visually, cinematically, acting-wise, thematically, the beautiful writing by Tennessee Williams. Is it the greatest American play? If it isn't, it sure is close. It's worth pointing out, Catherine Hepburn did Glass Menagerie. They filmed it. And it's not, I don't hear people talking about it as much as Streetcar. No. Just saying. Just no. throwing that out there. The first film of Glass Menagerie was very unsuccessful. It was Horribly miscast with the British star of Gertrude Lawrence playing Amanda Wingfield. Absolutely, she cannot do it. She fails the film. She's all wrong. 
without a transcendent Amanda, you don't have a glass menagerie. Joanne Woodward eventually played the character, I think. Yes, she was, she's the best Amanda I've seen. She was very good director by her husband. By Paul Newman. He was a very fine director. Foster, oh my gosh, it's been so fantastic to get to sit down and talk with you. Your book is out now. People can go and buy it. Hollywood and the movies of the 50s. I have my copy signed by you and Millie yes, Perkins and Diane Baker and all these yes. other amazing people that you had out here in LA. Where can fans get in touch with you, find you online, anything you have coming thank up that you. they should know about? Thank you, Kristen. I have a website, www.fosterhirsch.inc. Any of your listeners want to write to me, I always respond to everything. Good, bad, and indifferent. I am a testament to that. I've emailed Foster on a whim, and he has answered me. I respond. I will be at the TCM Festival in L.A. in April. And I'll be doing, I'm hoping, other events for Larry Edmonds, my good friend Jeff, who runs Larry Edmonds, a great bookstore. We'll be doing another event for the out-of-town visitors who come to that great festival. And I have some other events coming up, but the big one is TCM. That is going to close out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us always on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, and we love one for 2024, so leave one for us on Apple Podcasts. You can follow the show on X at Ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Ticklish Biz. You can follow me at therap.com, as well as on all social media profiles at Kristen Lopez 88 and my new official author page, which is KristenKLopez.com. Emily Edwards is on social media at Ms. Emily Edwards, so be sure to give her a follow. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content, like my upcoming Dave Carger interview, as well as all of our really great social media videos designed by our new videographer, Jenny Hawkins. Consider helping us at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Emily and I both have books out. You can order them wherever you buy books. We will return on April 10th, going from... 1951 to the rollicking 1960s with a look at the Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night. Till then.